How y'all doing this morning? We are starting a new series today entitled Low Hanging Fruit. We're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5 and the fruits of the Spirit. And the fruit that, not the fruits, but the fruit, singular, the fruit that we're looking at this morning is patience. Do y'all have patience in the middle of traffic? Come on, Jesus, help us. Um, let me introduce myself if you're new this morning. My name is Adam and I'm the pastor here and it is a, a privilege to welcome you here and for you to worship with us if you are new today. Man, my desire is that you uh, encounter Jesus today and you feel the love of Jesus from our church family. And uh, man, we're just so glad and thrilled that you've joined us on uh, this Sunday. Uh, let's pray and let's just welcome the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. We come before you this morning, Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. God, I pray that you would just speak to us. What we say to you this morning, God speaks for your servants are listening. God, would you breathe upon your logos word and make it rhema to us. The gods we talk about, the fruit of the spirit, God, specifically patience. That Lord, you would teach us and mold us and shape us. And help us to walk patience out supernaturally. It only comes from your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you. We honor you today. We're here for you and you alone. No one came here to hear a message from me. But we all came here just to hear from you. So God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to give you a definition of low-hanging fruit to get started this morning. Low-hanging fruit, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, means this. It's easy things that can be most readily done or dealt with in achieving success or making progress towards an objective. As followers of Jesus, we should easily live out the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. It should be easily lived out in our lives. Sadly, though, what happens is we put our attention on the gifts of the Spirit when God says that every good and perfect gift comes from whom? God himself. And when we're going after the gifts of the Spirit versus just going after God, it, it, it results in this shallow relationship with a loving God. So this is kind of a reset this morning. We want to put our attention on God and live out the fruit of the Spirit. Let's read Galatians chapter 5 where we find the fruit of the Spirit. And again, this is a series about the fruit of the Spirit and how it can be easily obtainable if we just listen to the Spirit of God. Galatians 5, 16 through 26, let's read. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Praise God for that. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealous, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, uh, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like which I tell you before, and just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what we're after, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self con Troll. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. You see, it is our responsibility as believers to choose to walk in the Spirit. 
and to not walk in the flesh. We can choose, it's a choice of ours to walk in the spirit. You see, every single day there's a battle going on in, in, inside of us to make the choice, I'm gonna listen, am I gonna listen to the spirit or am I gonna listen to my flesh? Am I gonna listen to what I want to do or am I gonna listen to what God is leading me to do? You see, every single day we have to make the choice, God, would you renew my mind? How does he renew your mind? I mean, it's through the word of God. He changes us through his word. That's why it's so important every single day to get into the word, to get into prayer, to spend time with Jesus. Because then it will renew your mind. You're able to reflect these fruits. It just comes natural. I read a statistic uh, this past week, and uh, it said that if you spend time with the Lord and, and reading his word three times during the week, it has negligible difference in your life. If you spend the time reading the word of God four times a week, it has a little bit uptick of difference in your life. But as a believer, if you spend time reading the word, spending time with Jesus, five times or more during the week, it upticks like tremendously, like something changes in the life of the believer when we begin to do that. You see, staying connected to Jesus, which causes us to live out the fruit of the spirit. Jesus said this in John 15, 5, that I am the vine and you are the branch. So Christ is the vine and we are the branches. In order for us to be changed, we have to stay connected to the vine. We have to stay connected to Jesus. And it says this, that we, we can do nothing apart from him, including being patient. How do we live out supernatural patience? How do we walk in patience? It's through being connected to Jesus. Every fruit is available when we're connected to Jesus. It comes that way. You see, Christ is the vine, and the spirit, its roots grow deep. and offers us nourishment, which allows us to bear fruit. Let me put it this way. Christ creates access to the spirit through the cross. The spirit creates access to the fruit through our surrender to the spirit. See, it's through surrendering to the spirit that we're able to access this fruit and bear this fruit and live it out. So we must hunger desperately, church, for the spirit of God. We have to hunger desperately for the spirit of God in our lives. Our lives must constantly desire to hold on to Jesus, to cling to him, to become like him. And we can be confident if we remain hungry for the Lord, if we remain in his word, if we remain in prayer, then he will produce through us fruit that reminds people of himself. How many of you want to be a reflection of Jesus in this room? Like, come on. We want to reflect Jesus. How do we do that? How do we bear this fruit? It's through staying connected to the vine. But it seems today that many are not bearing this fruit and we call ourselves Christians. But if we bear this fruit, it only happens through staying connected to Jesus in this world because we are not bearing fruit. It doesn't want anything to do with Christians. It doesn't want anything to do with us. You see, the trap is, is we would rather display the giftings of the Spirit than to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is dangerous. You see, one moment we're operating in prophecy, tongues, or another gift, gift of wisdom. I'm about to read the list here in a moment, operating these things, but then we're rude the next moment to someone. And what happens is the world's looking at us like, I don't want anything to do with them. They're just weird. They're just hokey. They're just, they're not offering this love, this joy, this peace. We have to stay connected to Jesus. Because the scary thing is this, that you can operate in the gift of the spirit and not being connected to Jesus. How? Because it is a gift from God that he has given every believer freely. We're going to talk more about this in a series in the future. But here's the thing. You can, you can operate in the gift because it's been given to you, or you can be listening to the wrong spirit. And so you're operating in this gift, listening to the wrong spirit, but not operating in it with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you see how dangerous it is to be operating in the gift and not have the fruit of the Spirit? It's dangerous. It ruins people's hearts and motives. Let me, let me give you this list. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the list of the gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gift of healings, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. You see, the thing is, in our pride, we'd rather be known by our spiritual giftings. But how will the body of Christ be known? The Word of God says they will know us, not by our spiritual giftings, but by our what? By our love. Pride says, man, they're going to know me because I speak in tongues, or they're going to know me because I prophesied over someone, or they're going to know me because I interpret something, or they're going to know me because of my incredible wisdom through the Spirit. No, they're going to know you by your love. If our pursuit is something else, then something is wrong in our hearts. They will know us by our love. May we be a church where people know us by our love. Our love and our love alone. And that's what we're after in this series, the fruit that should be so easily obtainable. You see, it's not out of willpower or self-discipline that we walk in this fruit. It's the discipline of killing our flesh and walking with Jesus. Then we produce this type of fruit. It's not the fruit of your life. It's the fruit of the Spirit's life. Notice it says fruit of the Spirit, not works or behavior modification. It's when you abide and are attached to the vine, this will naturally become the result. Religion says I have to have this discipline to be patient. But the Spirit says stay connected to me and I'll supernaturally give you patience. We don't produce the fruit of the Spirit instead We eat of the Spirit, and then the Spirit produces the fruit through us. See the difference? Let's talk about this fruit. We're going to talk about this morning, patience. Patience. You know, this is one area that I probably naturally struggle in more than any other fruit of the spirit. When I read that list, I'm like, okay, this is, this is one where, man, I'm not really walking in the spirit as well as I should when I'm being challenged in this area. I sometimes have a tendency to listen to my flesh in the area of patience, not towards someone else, but really generally to- towards myself. For, for example, when I'm driving down a road and I, you know, there's might be three lanes and in the far right lane, there's seven cars in the middle lane, there's, there's four cars in the la- la- lane over here to the left side, there's two cars. I'm going to swing all the way over from the right lane to the left lane, you know what I'm saying, to get in the shortest line because of my lack of patience. Another example is when I was, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I've learned this because I got enough tickets as, a, as an 18-year-old, uh, but I used to speed everywhere I went. I was a speed demon. It was not safe. It was not good. But I learned because of these tickets that I'm no longer going to do this. I had to learn to listen to the spirit instead of my flesh to no longer speed to get where I'm going quickly. I'm impatient when putting things together too, y'all. Anybody else in here, like, instructions, what are those? Like, I'm not going to... My instructions are looking at the box, and I'm like, okay, that's how you put it together. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. And the problem with this and this lack of impatience to read the instructions first before I get started on a project is there's always inevitably a, a piece that's left over after I do something and put something together. My wife, at the end of, um, of uh, beginning of summer, when, uh, when fire pits were cheap, she bought one from Target when it was 30 bucks. And so, uh, you know, we were putting it together last weekend and I went to go put it and I opened up the box and saw all these pieces. I'm like, Oh, no, this is, this is not going to be good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to try my patience. So I went to my wife and I was like, hey, let's just do this together. I'm going to hand you the tools. We're going to talk. We're going to enjoy it. Like, and, and man, she help, I helped her put it together. Like it, it worked out really well doing that because of my lack of patience. I knew myself. I didn't want to be challenged in that area that day. Now, how about patience towards other people? Do we have patience towards other people? It could be a boss who gave a promotion to someone else when he felt like you should be the one to get it. It could be a friend who might have treated you misfairly or 
whatever else it might be. There might be some kind of tension going on right there. Are you extending them patience? How about patience towards your spouse? How about patience towards your kids? Right? We all need help in this area to walk in supernatural patience. It only happens through the spirit. We need to be able to control our emotions. But thankfully, God says he will supply all of your needs according to the riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That, y'all, that includes patience. He will supply patience in your time of need when you listen to the spirit. Let me give you the Greek word for patience that we find in the New Testament. The Greek word is this, macrothumia which is a combination of two words. Macro meaning long and thumia meaning temper. It specifically points to the idea of anger taking a very long time to build up before it's expressed. Some people, they have short tempers, meaning it only takes one small thing to set them off. One thing and man, they're getting angry just like that. Right? There's nothing worse or more detrimental than being on the receiving end of someone who has a short temper. It's hurtful, it's hard, it's difficult to receive someone who has that short temper, who's easily angered. One thing that sticks out in my mind as I was kind of thinking about this was when I was seven years old, uh, I was in the backseat of a uh, car with my dad was driving and my sister was in the backseat as well, I believe. And, we were driving down a back country road and the person behind us was following my dad way too closely. And so my dad just kind of pumps the brakes a little bit. Hey, signal, get off my tail a little bit. You know what I'm saying? He's not too happy. The guy doesn't get off his tail. Again, he pumps the brakes a little bit more. The guy still is not off of his tail. And so finally my dad decides to slam on the brakes and that car hits him from behind. And my dad's a believer, like he loves the Lord. He's a follower of Jesus and, I, and, he's, and he has always been strong with the Lord in that area. But in that moment, because that guy was following him too closely, what was he doing? He was listening to his flesh and not his spirit. And so he slams on the brakes and hit him. He gets out of the car and he, what are you doing? I've got two kids in here. And I'm thinking to myself, dad, well, you, yeah, you have to, because why'd you slam on the brakes, Right? There's nothing more detrimental if that guy knew that my, that my dad was a, a Christian, a believer. Like, I mean, that guy's never going to come to the Lord again because of that reaction. Out of, or he might come to the Lord, but there's going to be a barrier up. You know what I'm saying? Other people, they're able to control their anger. They're able to control their temper. There might be every reason for you to go off on someone. There might be every reason you might have the right to go do it, but you say, I'm going to be patient through the Spirit's help. I'm going to extend patience towards this person. I'm not going to act out of anger. You see, when we are patient, we do not quickly retaliate. We turn like for like or take revenge. Patience is self-restraint in the face of being provoked. It doesn't quickly punish but thinks before it responds. And if it responds, it responds appropriately. Amen? Amen. So let me give you three things on patience. Number one, we can grow in patience. We can grow in patience. You know, the secret to patience is found in Galatians 5, 16, which we read earlier. And it's really the secret to walking in every single fruit of the Spirit. Let's read this again. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. You know when I've struggled with impatience and hurry, it's a result of not being connected to the Spirit of God. How do we become disconnected to God? Through hurry. What's the way that we hurry in society today? It's I mean, we were multitaskers. We think that we can multitask. Is there anyone in this room good at multitasking? Like, said, it's rare to find a guy who's good at multitasking, yeah? <laughs> we compartmentalize everything. We think that we can drive in the car, take our kids to school, have a conversation with them, at the same time eating a donut, drinking coffee. 
checking our phone, text messaging someone, right? Checking your calendar. Or have you ever done this before? You're watching TV, and so while you're watching TV, you're doing some work on the side of your computer, then you have your iPad over here, you're playing a game, and then you're scrolling through Facebook on your phone. All while your kids come in and try to have a conversation with you, you act like you're listening. Like, I mean, multitasking, what does it do? It's causing us to hurry. It's really coming from a spirit of just trying to hurry, trying to get things done. And so we're disconnected from God. Listen, hurry is the enemy of our spiritual lives. It will take a toll on your spiritual life when you begin to hurry in your life. One of my favorite books of all time is this book called The Life You Always Wanted by John Ortberg. And it sounds like a very surfacey book, but man, it's a really deep spiritual book. And he says this in the book. He says, we must ruthlessly eliminate hurry in our life. Why? Because hurry takes us from being connected to the vine and connected to Jesus. We must be people who ruthlessly eliminate hurry in a society that tells us, man, you need to hurry. You can multitask. You can do more. Yeah. Number two, we are to be patient with others. We're to be patient with others. Proverbs 15, 18, a patient man calms a quarrel. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Paul reminds us to be patient to who? Say it out loud. To everyone. Be patient to who? Everyone. Everyone. Let's use Moses' example. Even though Moses knew that God was patient, he had a hard time at different points in time in his life of being extending the same patience towards the children of Israel because they were seemed like they were always complaining, mumbling, whatever else, and so he lost his patience towards them. One example is Numbers chapter 20. And in Numbers chapter 20, God tells Moses, hey, Moses, I want you to gather the assembly together. I want you to gather everyone together. And then I want you to speak to the rock. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce water out of that rock. And I'm going to provide a miracle for the people of God. And they're going to be blown away. But what does Moses do with God's instruction? Let's read about it. Numbers 20, verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, here now, you rebels, must we bring the water for you out of this rock? Can't you see Moses' attitude right here? He has an attitude towards the people of Israel. Verse 11, then Moses lifted his hands, hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out of it abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hollow me or to honor me, to worship me, in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land which I have given to them. So when God told Moses to speak to the rock and I'm going to draw out water for all the people, what did Moses do? And in his impatience towards the children of Israel, he decided in his frustration to hit the rock twice and then water would come out. And what happened was because of his impatience with others, he was not able to inherit the promised land that was promised to him. You see, your impatience with others can hold you back even from your destiny because of your sin. You see, Moses was usually at times a, different, a very patient person, but even patient people have their limits. Moses in that moment, man, he hit his limit. And so we all need... It's not through mustering up willpower or just through discipline. We all need this supernatural patience that only comes from the Spirit of God. You know, one very powerful prayer that we can pray is, God, would you help me see people the way you see people? Lord, would you help me see that person God, the way you see it, I don't care what I've heard about anyone. I don't care about the gossip going on around that person. Lord, let me see your child. See, every single person is a child of God. You're a son and daughter of God. And God has an incredible love for every single person. God, help me to see that person, Jesus, the way you see that person and extend the same grace and patience and love that you've extended them. We have a value around it here. It's the value of edification. And how we say is we want to speak life. How we articulate is we want to see people the way God sees people. We want to 
Speak life and not death and call out destiny in others. Have you ever spoken life into someone and all of a sudden, man, they just, something changes in their heart and their spirit and they are able to accomplish something and they recognize the calling of God on their life because you call it out. You see, our words have power. We see people the way God sees people, not the way our flesh wants to see them. You may say to yourself, man, I wonder why that person is just feels so distant. I wonder why that person has such anger. Maybe it's because they're struggling with something in their life. Or maybe you may say, man, I wonder why that person doesn't, doesn't want to be my friend. Maybe it's because they've experienced rejection before and they've put up a wall. Or maybe you'll say, man, why isn't that person just surrender fully to God? Maybe it's because they've experienced hurt before. What do you do in those situations? You pray for that individual. You extend patience towards them. Allow the Holy Spirit to work on them. And in the right timing, you speak to them and you speak truth to them when you feel led by the Spirit of God. Not out of your own flesh or your own emotions or what you think should happen in that situation, but through the Spirit of God. Amen. It is a supernatural work of his spirit when we try to understand why people act the way they do and then respond to their behavior with love, truth, and proper timing instead of uncontrolled anger. Which leads me to number three this morning. God is patient. God is patient. Aren't you thankful that we serve a patient God who is so incredibly patient with his children, with us? No one is more patient than God is. It's hard to understand the patience of God when we live in a world that is so impatient, where people are hurrying and going around. But we have a hard time perceiving the patience of God, but God is so patient with us. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, God is patient with you. Just take that in for a moment. God is patient with you. Receive that. God is patient with us. In Nehemiah chapter 9, we read this in our last series and went through the book of Nehemiah. When they were experiencing that revival and they turned from their sin and they're celebrating what God did, Ezra offers this prayer up to God. And he says this. He said, for many years you were patient with them, but in your great mercy, you do not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. I'm going to read it one more time. For many years you were patient with them, but in your great mercy, you do not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. You see, throughout Scripture, we see God expressing patience with people. In your life, in your marriage, temptation, and your sin or any other area of your life, do not think for a moment that God has given up on you, church. If you have given up on yourself, God has not given up on you. If you feel that you are out of strength to keep fighting, God will give you strength from a place you did not expect it to come from. If you are continually trying to kick a habit, turn from a certain sin, and have run out of will to overcome it, Listen, God can give you a new determination through his spirit to overcome. Even if you just need a whisper, God, I need your help. He will hear the cry of your heart. He will receive that and he will help you through his spirit. You see, God will not walk out on you. Don't you dare walk out and give up on God. He won't do it. You see, we are all sinners in need of the grace of God. We're all in need of his patience towards us. And here's what Paul, this reminds me so much of this. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. Of whom, Paul is saying, I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his immense patience 
as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. You see, Paul's name was once Saul. And God changed his name because before he literally murdered Christians. And he's saying in this text, I am the, Timothy, I am the worst of sinner, but in God's patience, he extended his love and his grace towards me. When I did not deserve it, I deserved to go to hell, but in his patience, he rescued me. And he says, all praise and glory and honor be unto God. I was the worst of sinners but in his patience. He has saved me. If you think for a moment that you've done anything not to receive the same patience, listen, he was a killer of Christians. You have the patience of God. God is patient with you. God is patient with me. But here's the thing. You have to know that even though God is a patient God, that his son... Is coming back quickly. His son is returning for a bride that he loves. And you can be a part of that bride. You can come into the family of God. Listen, if, you, if, you, if you're not absolutely, positively sure that you're a child of God, today is your day to give your life to Jesus because in his patience he has extended this to you. There's nothing you could ever do to earn it. There's nothing you could ever do to deserve it. You see, it's only in his patience that he's allowed us, allowed me, to walk into eternal life. Would you rise with me? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning.